Why couldn't Lightning McQueen be Jackson Storm? I mean, I understand that he was getting older, but Lightning was one of the greatest race cars of all time. How is it possible that the winner of seven Piston Cups couldn't figure out a way to best him? Like, if it truly was his aging technology that was holding him back, why didn't he get some upgrades for himself? I mean, Lightning went through a devastating crash. Wouldn't that have been a perfect time to rebuild him into a next-gen racer? What I want to finally understand after all these years is what was actually holding Lightning McQueen back. And through this desire to understand Lightning's limitations, I believe we can explore an even deeper question, how do cars evolve? Now, of course, we are told that Jackson Storm was built from the ground up to be a high-tech racer. It was intended to dominate the veterans who came before him. Storm had an optimized drivetrain, a lower center of gravity, his aerodynamic profile was improved, his components were lighter weight, and he trained using advanced simulators unlike anything the world had ever seen. He even possessed a high-capacity battery pack to get instant torque at any moment, and he could hold the optimal driving line lap after lap. As Natalie Certain explained, Storm achieved his top speeds by exploiting the numbers. Every aspect of a racer that could be improved was put into the next-gen racers so that they could win the Piston Cup. But this is not a new phenomenon. While Jackson Storm was built to surpass Lightning McQueen's generation, Lightning himself did the same thing when he first showed up on the scene. In his debut season, Lightning was one of the first racers of his generation to start competing, and you can visually see that in his rookie season. While most of the cars on the track had harsh angles and a boxy design and were led by a retiring legend in Strip the King Weathers, Lightning had a smooth aerodynamic profile, a booming engine, an incredible racing mind, and a bump and top speed. And even back in the day, when the fabulous Hudson Hornet arrived as a rookie, he was also the fastest car in his day. He had a lower center of gravity, he rarely overheated, and he drove amazingly on dirt tracks. So he started winning, and in The Art of Cars 3, HUD was even described as being a cocky rookie racer. By the way, if you want to check out all the art books I referenced in this video, I've linked them all for you down below. All that to say though, it's clear to see that every new generation was faster and more refined compared to the generation that came before them. But why couldn't the veterans keep up? I mean, Doc, the King, and Lightning all had the knowledge and the experience to remain competitive long after their retirements, which makes it seem like all they needed was a few upgraded parts. And it's not like we've never seen this happen before. I mean, it seems like Mater has been modified in every way imaginable. He got bigger tires when he was a wrestler, he was given wings to fly as a stunt plant, and there's been a number of times that he's got jets strapped on his back to make him one of the fastest cars alive. If mechanics can make a tow truck fly, then what was keeping them from turning Lightning and the other veterans into next-gen racers? Well, I think the answer actually exists through our understanding of how cars were changing so rapidly between generations. And that led me down a rabbit hole because I wanted to understand where these new cars came from. Like in the world of cars, are cars just naturally improving each generation, or are they being designed and constructed over time? Do cars biologically reproduce, which means they're evolving, or do you think there are factories producing all of these new cars? Well, we've kind of been given mixed messages on this. On the one hand, when the Lemons in Cars 2 said that their model was no longer being manufactured and that there was no one producing parts for them, that sure makes it seem like there's a production line somewhere that's building cars. From the way that process was being discussed, it sounds like there are very few vehicles that have control over that process, and that's supported in the Planes films. When Dusty's gearbox failed, he also found out that part was out of production and had been discontinued for a long time, which meant that there was no way for him to have it replaced. There were many parts shops that Dusty and his friends turned to, but none of them were able to find one for his model. Eventually, Dusty had a brilliant mechanic build him a completely new gearbox, but if he wouldn't have had that done, he might have never been able to fly at high speeds again without the risk of crashing. Most vehicles are powerless when it comes to ensuring they're able to get the parts they need to function. And it turns out they also have a limited understanding of where they come from and what happens to them 
when they die. Like we're told in the first Planes movie that many vehicles believe that they will be recycled into tractors, but they aren't certain about that future. There's not a universal understanding about what happens to a car's body when they pass away. They don't even know if their chassis will be used to create a new vehicle. I mean, remember, we even see a Pope in Cars 2, which implies that there is a history of Catholicism in this world, and that opens up the door to even more existential beliefs on where cars might come from. The truth is that their own existence seems to be beyond their own understanding, so the way cars are created and why they originally came to life must be more complex than just a simple assembly line. Another reason we can't simply state that cars are built in factories is because they have families. We know Mater has parents, a sister, and many cousins. Luigi has an uncle Topolino in Italy, and Francesco has a mother too. Honestly, this didn't convince me at first that cars were reproducing on their own, since there was always the possibility that after a car was built that they would be adopted into a family. But that idea doesn't make sense because there are non-sentient vehicles that roam this world. Now, of course, the original animal vehicle that we were introduced to was the tractor in Cars, but it's actually in the art of planes that we're given more context into how they developed. You see, we're told that the earliest domestication of the North American tractor can be traced back to the 1800s during the construction of the first transcontinental railroad. So clearly, Tractors are not some kind of entity that are being designed and constructed to keep their population alive because they were once developing on their own without any sentient life intervening. If the sentient vehicles were building the tractors, they wouldn't have had to go through the process of domestication to integrate them into their farms. And of course, there are also a lot of other examples of wild vehicles existing. There are bugs, deer, and little planes who exist on their own in the wilderness, and it's actually those little toy planes that I believe give us a huge insight into improving our understanding of how cars are born. You see, in Planes Fire and Rescue, we are shown wild planes that build nests to raise their offspring, which proves that vehicles can reproduce independently. And the children do not begin as full-sized vehicles. The baby planes were significantly smaller than their parent, which reveals that cars do grow over time into adults. But we can't avoid the reality that cars do rely on parts to be manufactured for them. And just like cars in our world, each car is associated with a make and model. I mean, in Cars 2, after identifying a villain's engine, Holly Shiftwell was able to find the exact number of models that engine was placed into, the number of years that engine was in production, and the number of cars that used that engine. So how is it possible that cars are able to be born organically, while at the same time they are all tied to information that would come from being produced by a corporation? Well, here's how I think this all fits together. You see, when a car is born, I think they would resemble their parents and have similar mechanical systems and technology to them. But since we know vehicles need to grow up and inevitably become full-sized cars, that means they would all eventually need a new body. You see, the filmmakers behind the world established that everything needed to remain true to materials. What this means is that since our world has cars made out of metal, then the vehicles in the world of cars need to have the majority of their body look, feel, and behave like they're made out of metal. So when a car is growing up, presumably, they would have the opportunity to enter a new metal body. There's even this really messed up deleted scene from the original film that captured this kind of idea. In a nightmare, Lightning would have his engine placed into Bessie, and at that point his mind would be trapped inside this construction machine while his race car shell was left behind. Now, since then, we've been told that cars are actually able to replace their engine block, so simply moving around someone's engine wouldn't actually shift their consciousness into another car, but I think there would be a way to accomplish this idea. You see, I previously made a video all about Doc Hudson's death, where I realized that cars have a mechanical aspect to themselves and a biological aspect to their lives. They're separate systems, so when the organic side of them would outgrow their childhood mechanical body, that's when they would need to be integrated into a new car, which would most likely be mass-produced by companies across the world. 
And that would explain why young racers like Jackson Storm would have all the latest technology integrated within them. They most recently entered into their adult frame. So of course, they would have every next gen feature that would transform them into the superior racing machine. But to bring this all back to Lightning, I think there's three main reasons that he and other veteran racers couldn't get those features too. For one, veteran racers might face some internal resistance to changing every aspect of themselves to attempt to be the best. Perhaps they don't want to tear themselves apart, but I do think there might be some physical limitations for them as well. You see, another limitation to cars upgrading themselves could be that their biology restricts them. You see, I think at some point a car's biological systems would stop growing, which would mean that it would be practically impossible for them to transfer into a new body. I believe they become completely integrated with the mechanics of their adult car, and that means they can no longer be untethered from it. Like, Guido's eyes would be too small to fill up a giant semi-truck like Mac, and Mac's eyes have absolutely grown too big to fit into Guido's tiny forklift body. After some time, their biology becomes incompatible with other car bodies. So I don't think Lightning could just put himself into a more aerodynamic frame like Jackson Storm's. And if cars couldn't transfer to a new frame, then that would also mean that they would most likely be limited by the technology that actually works with their mechanical systems. As technology developed, upgrades might have been available, but that doesn't mean that they would always be able to correspond with their older machines. Veteran racers were probably in bodies that couldn't work with the latest advancements in racing technology. Maybe parts manufacturers were just not incentivized to develop upgrades that were compatible for older vehicles. Sure, there were some mechanics who were capable of producing new parts for other vehicles or adding external accessories to a car's body, but those were not common individuals. And I'm sure customizations like that would be a lot more dangerous and risky. Lady McQueen was a legendary race car, but while it might have seemed like he had the experience, the resources, and the heart to race forever, I think he was limited by his own body. As he approached the end of his career, I think the reason he could no longer compete with the next-gen racers is because he was bound to his outdated mechanical body and was unable to receive the newest technology that was in all of the rookies. Lightning had the heart to be a champion, but he no longer had the speed to win. But now I'd love to turn the conversation over to you. Why do you think Lightning couldn't beat Storm? Let me know in the comments. Thank you to all of my supporters over on Patreon. And of course, if you'd like to see more Cars videos like this one, subscribe for more. Finally, I'm Isaac Carlson. Thanks for watching and have a magical day.